Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Dennis Romboy, reporter with the Deseret News, Thomas Burr, Salt Lake Tribune's Washington Bureau Chief, and Heidi Hatch, anchor and reporter with KUTV. Thank you all for being on uh, the show tonight. We're glad to have you with us. I wanna jump right in. The topic many of us are talking about right now still because it's impacting us in so many ways, uh, COVID-19 and the state's response. Uh, I wanna go through uh, how Utah is, uh, is handling this as opposed to what's happening around the country. I wanna start with you, Thomas, for just a moment because Utah is one of eight states that has not put a sort of a, a stay in place order on its citizens. You're, you're stationed there in Washington, DC, you're seeing the country. How is Utah different than what we're seeing in other parts of the country? It was, it's interesting, if I were to walk out of my house right now for a, a non-essential, uh, uh, you know, activity. If I were to, I go to the grocery store is fine, the pharmacy is fine, uh, but if I were to just go out to have, you know, have fun, uh, there's a, a $5,000 fine or 90 days in jail. And that's uh, similar to some parts of the country like California, New York, uh, Illinois. Uh, I mean, most of the country is under these kind of orders, uh, all of course attempting to, to flatten the curve. Uh, Utah is trying to take a please don't go out of your house uh, effort, which is much different than the don't go out of your house effort. Yeah, that is so true. Heidi, that, that is the big difference right there. This kind of the, the please, which maybe it's a little more than that, but that's kind of the, the essence right there because there's not a penalty attached to it necessarily. Explain kind of how that's working in Utah because signs are uh, maybe the, the curve uh, is, is not what was expected when we started. That's right. It seems like the numbers, I think, are lower than we thought. And maybe that's because we're doing a good job. It's hard to tell right now for sure. But depending on where you live, people are following this better. I think that there's people looking out their window calling the police when they see their neighbors, you know, walking in a group that's too big. And then we see videos coming out of Utah County where we still have some college students that are living in apartments. They're living life la vida loca like it's normal. They're having barbecues. They're playing volleyball. So there are definitely pockets and counties that are taking this more seriously than others. And right now it's kind of early to tell if our test numbers are going to align with mm -hmm. how people are acting or reacting. De Dennis, you're interviewing lots of people and your paper's doing great coverage on this also. Are, are Utahns feeling like they would rather have that next step where it becomes a little, a little more difficult to go out or there's some kind of penalties attached? Well, I think people are kind of divided on that. Um, I think there's a good core of people who don't even want to follow the uh, the restrictions that are in place and, and think they're they're too restrictive. And then you have another group that says, "Hey, let's take that next step. Let's follow the rest of the country and have a, a shelter in place or a stay at home order because there's a little bit more force of law behind that, like what Tommy's experienced in back in Washington. Uh, we're no we're nowhere near that. Um, and also, we have people you know sending stuff into our newsroom every day about people violating the orders too. And I was at a park last night. I watched a group of kids playing basketball. I watched them playing other games and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't know that there's really compliance uh, is, is very even across the state. So I think it's, it's part of what we're seeing is people don't really feel the effects yet themselves. So they don't feel that this, this restriction is necessary, right? So only 13% of Americans in the last poll I saw actually knew somebody affected by COVID-19. And until they actually have a relative or a friend uh, who's in the hospital because of this, there, there's really, they don't see the, the, the extreme measures uh, as necessary. I think that really is one of the biggest problems right now. Every time I look at social media on Facebook, almost everyone's asking the question, show me one person, do you know one person? I don't know anyone. And here in Utah, we're very different than what's happening in New York City. And so that divide until it hits you in the face or you know someone or you feel like it's affecting you, it feels like what we call fake news these days. And they're like, you guys are blowing it out of proportion. I think our last poll, our last poll showed that only 6% of Utahns actually knew someone or related to someone that had COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So explain this because uh, we're talking about people who are maybe are not, not obeying this, this stay at home directive we received from the governor. Heidi, I was kind of curious because just last night, uh, I guess a couple of nights ago, the Salt Lake County came out and said that um, 
they're going to put some compliance forms online where people in the state of Utah are able to, I, I guess, report on their neighbors. Uh, there's even a website where you can upload pictures and videos of people who, you, who we think maybe are violating. How, how do you feel like that's going to go over? That's kind of an interesting next step. It's an interesting next step, and I think it's 50-50, and it's becoming very political. And uh, a lot of people here in Utah are saying, you know, this is a police state. This is not what we want to do. We really need to respect our constitutional rights. And there's other people who are saying, okay, we can do without some of those rights. We can report on our neighbors right now because it's a situation where we need to be. So I think there's definitely two trains of thought. And just like anything else on the political spectrum, this is turned political, and you're either far right, far left, uh, you don't come in your house, you don't look through the window at people, or you are looking through the window and you're writing in a license plate to your neighbors and sending it in. But even police who say, report it to us, they say, you know, we'll get to it if we can. They have other problems, bigger problems, yeah. fish to fry right now. So they may go out there and give you a warning, but unless you're going out of your way to spread disease or do something insane, you're not gonna get a ticket and it's probably gonna be two or three warnings down the road. Mm -hmm. I think I think that reporting on neighbors has been going on since this started, not formally like Salt Lake City has, but you look at social media, people are posting videos of, of people violating social distancing and, and things constantly. That's That's been a barrage of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting also is that uh, our, our counties in the state are handling this in a different way. That's an example of how Salt Lake County is, is handling that. Uh, and, and Tommy, I'm kind of curious how this relates to what's happening in the rest of the country, too, because our legislature in the state of Utah has become concerned uh, that there is not statewide jurisdiction or control over these kinds of efforts. Yeah, and there's a, there's a, a concern maybe right now that the state legislature is going to say the counties can't individually do that, mm -hmm. that uh, the, it's a state decision. Uh, but let me, I'm not going to say whether that's good or bad. What I am going to re report are the facts, which is this virus doesn't care if you're a Republican, independent, uh, the Democrat, liberal, conservative, uh, white, black, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, and it doesn't know county lines. It doesn't know state boundaries. Uh, and, and, and just one person going to rural area uh, from an urban area could affect, uh, you know, a, a ton of people. Uh, so really, I, I don't know in the end uh, what can really stop it other than it, it has to be done in some form that, that works for everyone because Sully mm -hmm. County versus where I'm from originally, which is Sevier County, is a big difference, but everyone can still be infected. Yeah, absolutely right. Sp speaking of kind of that statewide, the, the border there, Heidi, uh, Utah is about to put into effect uh, today on Friday some restrictions and reporting on travel anytime you come into on a highway or to our airport. Talk about what's happening right there, some of those efforts. Well, there are a lot of people saying that this is Big Brother <clears throat> stepping into our lives as well. It's probably going to be a little different um, at the airport and the border. If you cross the border, and I kind of like to test it and just see how it works, go drive to Wyoming and back over the weekend, mm -hmm. you get a text on <clears throat> your phone and then it's voluntary. They say you're not, they're not gonna go after you, but you'll get a notification on your phone where you go online and then you fill out uh, the form and give them information. Same thing sort of at the airport when you come out in, you'll get a QR code. You should uh, go online, fill out that information. They're also waiting for thermometers to come in where they don't actually have yeah. to touch you. So how long that takes, I don't know. And they'll be taking your temperature. So uh, this is something the Salt Lake City uh, mayor is pushing for right now. The governor uh, made this possible. So we're going to be testing people. It is realistic right now. We only have about 1,900 people a day coming into Utah, but it definitely is not something we're used to in the United States of America, where you go where you want, do what you want, and don't have to ask anyone's permission. So it's definitely um, a new world. Dennis, I'm curious what, what you're hearing from, from your readers when you're reporting, because you, you, look, you look back at some of those inflection points in our, in our history to what Heidi was just talking about, like after 9-11, for example. You know, uh, we, we, we had a lot of these kinds of feelings. We were wondering what, the, what it was going to be like day to day, and now we have all these, these restrictions on, on travel and what happens when you go. But now we have this, uh, another thing. Is this kind of just the next step for us where you, know, you come in and all of a sudden everyone's getting their, their temperature checked or you know, answering a series of questions? That, that seems a little beyond you know, having to take off your belt and shoes when you go to the airport. But we've come to accept that. That's the way that, that you fly and travel nowadays. You, you take off your belt and your shoes and you unload your bag or you know, whatever the TSA asks you to do. Um, you pretty much comply with that, and and over time we've come to accept that. Um, personally, I don't know that we can see uh, taking temperatures as a as a permanent measure uh, 
going forward. But I think incrementally people have come to accept things like that. And to me, it'd be interesting to see how many people actually comply when they get mm -hmm. that text and, and go online and fill out that form. And I hope the state has a way to, to track how many they text they sent out and how many people actually go and do that. Um, they're already in the state at that point too. I, I don't know that, uh, uh, mm -hmm. are we gonna force them into quarantine? I, I guess that's kind of unclear at, the, at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the follow-up's the big one. Do you have a room you're gonna hold them at at the airport? Are you gonna use a hotel near the airport? Are you gonna tell them just to go to the hotel and stay? There comes the problem. You answer all these questions and then what do you do with them? Are you there and actually going to do something about the answers you get? That's true, assuming they're just telling the answers uh, truthfully. Uh, another question there. Uh, uh, Thomas, one of the things that's interesting is uh, the business community's response uh, to, to this. Uh, I want to specifically talk about the Silicon Slopes because uh, our business community has gathered together in a very significant way, particularly this high tech industry, to try to help, not from just from testing, but to the business uh, side of it as well. Talk about what's happening right there and why that community is so engaged. Sure, it's different than what I'm seeing. I think in, in many communities across the uh, across the country, uh, because this is an effort not only by the government to say what we should do. It's it's the private sector coming in and saying, you know, how can how can we help as well? The uh, the idea being, why not uh, join together? This is a community problem. This isn't just you know a, a governor's problem or a legislative problem. Everyone needs to do something. So the the idea that these these companies in Silicon Slopes. Uh, and, and, and community uh, organizations uh, and and the the government of Utah coming together to say let's get everyone tested let's find out this information let's see where this you know trace where it's coming from and where it's going and and everyone wins in the end if we can do that so why not join together uh, and it's it's really it seems to be a model that could be replicated across the United States to 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 collaborate. Yeah. So, De Dennis, this is uh, sort of unprecedented in terms of the, the collaboration there. This is their, their crush the curve approach. But what's interesting is uh, we're talking about the testing, but they're largely not just going to the people who um, are, do have the, the virus, but they're looking for uh, the people who uh, might be impacted by them as well. It's just people who are asymptomatic that are walking around, because that seems to be what they're worried about now, too. Those of us that are going out in the community thinking we're fine, but we're really spreading it. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, I think their goal was to test everybody. And I know that's, that's probably not possible, but this is kind of a, an effort to, to do that, to find those people and, and to get people to register, to test and, and see what, what we can learn about that and, and help flatten that curve. And part of the problem is getting the state in agreement with some of their tests. I know they're looking to test for antibodies to see if you actually had it done. And Angela Dunn, uh, the state epidemiologist, said, give us a few weeks to make sure those tests are accurate before we start doing it and we can actually trust those numbers. So therein lies the problem. If you've had it or you've been exposed to it, does it actually show up in your blood? It goes back to the olden days of the chicken pox. If you had, you know, one chicken pox, does it still show up in your same system the way that somebody was covered head to toe? And I think they're still trying to figure those things out. Very true. So much unknown, but I know that every day uh, we're learning more about that. Uh, our, our legislature is about to call themselves into a special session and to address at least some of the things we've just been talking about. But it's interesting. So uh, for, for the, the sake of the viewers, this was Amendment C that Utahns voted on, which gave the legislature the opportunity to call themselves into special session. For, for these reasons, uh, war, persistent fiscal crisis, natural disaster, or emergency in state affairs. Uh, so Dennis, what's, what's the reason if they do call themselves in special session? Well, f first of all, who knew that, uh, that, that they would be able to act on that this soon? Um, you know, it, there was a big fight about whether the legislatures would even have that uh, ability to call themselves into session because that's always been the, the governor's prerogative. And here we are, I don't know, was this last year, year, whatever, however, soon it is later, we're already considering this. Um, I guess they could call themselves uh, on two, two accounts on that, on the fiscal uh, situation and also an emergency situation. Yeah. And they have to adjust the budget because of uh, the tax collections will be different now because the tax deadlines have been pushed out to July for, uh, for filing taxes. And so that might be in a little bit of disarray. And then we have, uh, maybe they want to address some of these, uh, these county stay at home orders and try to bring some uniformity to that. Although the counties and the cities might see that as trying to, to 
grab some power away from, from those local jurisdictions. They probably will. Heidi, it's so interesting because uh, there is all this, this great discussion, at least in the political circles. This would be the first time the legislature could do this. And the, the law says that they, they have to wait 30 days after the end of the legislative session to do it. They can't call themselves in session for more than 10 days. But this Saturday is that 30 day mark. And we're already looking like this session is going to happen this next week. That's right. And I think it's a waiting game to see. And the thing that's interesting to me is that the legislature obviously has this power now to do so. The question is why the governor's waited. Right now, we're in an interesting time, whether you're talking about the president or the governor, but we're in an election year where there's a lot of people competing for those same jobs and a lot Mm -hmm. of people saying, you know, the governor not only should call this special session himself, but he should have called it yesterday, a week ago, two weeks ago. So the governor still has the opportunity where he could keep this, um, historic chance from happening and just call one himself, or we could see the legislature um, do what they set themselves up for and use this power. So it's going to be interesting watching to see who does this and why. Uh, The governor obviously doesn't have as much at stake politically as some of those who will still be in office after this, but he certainly has a legacy and I'm assuming wants to do the best he possibly can in his last days, months, and weeks in office. Is this a little bit of a duel between the two of them though, Heidi? Uh, Uh, Yes. (laughs) I definitely think so. And so I'm sure there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we can't see, but definitely there's a power struggle of sorts going on here. And the state of Utah is actually in a good place where we have a lot of money in a rainy day fund where if we needed to tap into that, we can. And we have that ability to say, yes, you can wait on these taxes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe the governor's not calling it into session because he doesn't want the question of, do we need a statewide order? He's obviously resisted that wanting to give some of these more rural counties a chance to be in charge of themselves and make those decisions. The legislature may not have something to lose like he does in that regard. Yeah, very true. Now, Dennis, what's what's interesting is uh, one of the issues that they may address is uh, the circumstances surrounding the next general election. Talk about what some of those possibilities are and why the legislature feels like they want to weigh in on that one. Well, I, I guess, you know, the COVID-19 has thrown all the campaign into disarray, really, uh, when you're talking about signature gathering, um, getting the primary uh, election set up, uh, conventions, all of that is virtual at this point. Um, and I guess some of the possibilities are the governor or the legislature could extend the deadlines for, for signature gathering for those candidates who are trying to get on the on the primary ballot that route. There's a possibility of uh, pushing the June primary back to August or something like that. I think about 15 states have already pushed their primaries either a couple of weeks or a month uh, down the road. Um, It'll be interesting to see if if Utah has an appetite to do that. We saw what happened in Wisconsin this week, Um, people standing in line with masks and and wanting to vote. Um, I don't know that we want that scene here in Utah, however, and then there's that whole vote by mail issue as well. Do we want to go strictly vote by mail? and I don't know about that. There's people who, who just have traditionally gone and voted uh, at the ballot box and want to continue to do that. So there's a lot of questions surrounding how we're going to handle this upcoming election. Yeah. Thomas, that vote, vote by mail issue is something I'd really like to get to because Utah has been, been experimenting with this fairly successfully. But this is not something around the country that everyone is feeling comfortable with, particularly uh, President Trump. Absolutely. He commented the other day during one of his many uh, now now just kind of standard five o'clock uh, press briefings uh, that he's concerned this is, you know, there's voter fraud that happens when you have mail in. How do you check? Uh, how do you check someone's ID when you do a mail in ballot? Uh, and we have seen a few minor cases of this. Uh, I think we saw some down in uh, Georgia uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it is is an issue that somehow is defined by a Republican or Democrat. Uh, and we saw it in Wisconsin. Uh, it is it is something that would make it very easy for people to vote, but on Republican side, they would say it also makes it very easy for, for fraud to happen. Uh, so when we have to remember, this is a state by state issue. The national government can't say, oh, the federal government can't say, oh, you have to do this, essentially. Uh, so we're going to see a different still state by state issues. But Oregon has been doing vote, mail, uh, vote by mail for, for years and has had uh, no major problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting. You, you add that vote, vote by mail, uh, Heidi, to what Dennis was talking about just a moment ago, too. The governor has had uh, an opportunity to address some of those issues like electronic signatures, for example, or delaying the amount of time it takes to get those signatures turned in. Uh, are you hearing from anyone that there's any appetite in our legislature to address that 
uh, as well? Or is that issue kind of done right now? I think it depends on who you talk to and maybe who they're backing. We're in an interesting year, too, where we have a lot of people uh, running for the governor's office. And a lot of them, people they've worked with, some of them already have their signatures, some are working to get them, and some have said, I'm not going to get them at all. So I think that's a little bit of a political question, too. Right now, you have Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox, who has his uh, numbers turned in. They've all been validated. So um, you look at someone like that, where they're like, you know what, you had your time, you could have gotten your signatures. And then we have someone like Huntsman, who turned in, I think, just shy of 40,000, and only about a half of them were verified. He's still frantically working to get those. And so the question becomes, who do you want to help here? Or do you say, sorry, you know, time's up, you could have, should have, would have. But I think no matter how you look at this, 28,000 signatures is a high bar. I mean, you look at how many people are running and you need individuals that haven't signed for someone else. It's a really high bar. So, and especially under the circumstances we're in. Here, and, and the irony to this, of all this to me is that Thomas Wright, who's not a big fan of signature gathering, was the first candidate to, to qualify through signature gathering. And here you have, uh, John Huntsman, who's scrambling to try to get enough signatures who probably would not fare as well at, at the convention as some of the more conservative candidates for governor. So to me, that, that's rather ironic how that's kind of played out so far. Mm -hmm. 10,000 other... spoons, all he needs is a knife, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know the song. Uh, t Thomas, one of the things that we should talk about too is uh, our legislature in their special session is going to need, need to address some of the issues surrounding the federal stimulus funds that are coming to the state. And I think that's particularly important since uh, in, in a recent Utah policy poll, 60% uh, of Utahns said that they were more worried about the impacts of coronavirus on the economy than they are on the impacts on public health. How is our legislature going to approach this and how uh, is, it, is it working for the federal stimulus funds to come into the state? Well, look, the, the federal government uh, just pumped $2.2 trillion into the U.S. economy. Uh, just to put that in perspective, uh, that's as much money as the federal government spends on non-military domestic spending every year. So that's huge. And they're not done. So we're going to see more money. Uh, part of that was to small business loans, to individual Americans. Uh, Y'all are probably going to get a check uh, sometime soon. Uh, but there's there's more needed. The hospitals need more funding, and states right now are looking at a huge drop in uh, in revenues that they would normally get from you know taxes on businesses. Uh, when the economy goes down, so does the revenue going to the state. Uh, so they're going to have to address this in some form. Uh, there was a poll a while back showing uh, you know there was a good uh, thirty percent of Republicans who would rather see the the, the government reopen uh, you know let government businesses reopen, mm -hmm. even if it puts uh, lives at risk. Uh, that the economy is more important than public health. Again, it goes back to what you talked about at the beginning. If you know somebody affected, uh, then you're going to be maybe changing your tune, and that could happen uh, in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Heidi, Thomas brought up uh, an, an issue that has been high on the list for Utahns, and it's uh, access to those uh, small business loans. Uh, uh, in, your, in your reporting and the people you're talking to, uh, are the small businesses feeling like they're going to have access to that? Are they, you know, is, is there is the pipeline to them uh, well understood at all? Because I think that's what we're hearing right now from all of them. And not to mention the fact that uh, all sorts of scams are coming around uh, this particular application process. Yeah, there's a lot of scams that goes everywhere. I wish that the bad guys would just take a break sometimes, but this is when they work their hardest. You know, I've talked to some business owners and some of them are like, you know, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. I don't know exactly what I'm doing. And then the banks you're going to, they're new at this too. So there's no real expert on this. But we have at Channel 2 talked to a couple of people who've figured out the process. They have jumped through those hoops. They filled out what they need to to make sure they get those loans. And those small business owners are then putting themselves out there for other small business owners, trying to mentor them and help them. And so I think there's a lot of that going on here in Utah where people are reaching out and saying, I've got it figured out, I've got it filled out, I wanna help you now too to make sure you get this money because the money that's coming from the national government for businesses, while we call it a loan, it really isn't a loan. As long as they're paying uh, their payroll, they're paying their mm -hmm. rent, they're paying their utilities, that's money they're not going to owe back, unlike some of the money that's coming from the state, those loans are important too. But if they can get these so-called loans from the federal government, it's money that will keep them afloat and they'll never owe back again, which is a really big deal for these small businesses. You probably saw that Mitt Romney tweeted yesterday that more than, I think, 3,500 businesses have already applied for the payroll protection program and received uh, over, I think, it was $700 million. So uh, they are aware of it, even though there's a lot of hoops to jump through and, and, and bureaucratic process to, to manage. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. when you need the money, I think you figure out what those hoops are and jump through them. I noticed too, I think there was a professor at Weber State University who's at home right now and made a video trying to step-by-step step go through the process. So if there is someone at home struggling that can't figure it out, helping them go through and make sure they're actually filling out the forms correctly so that when they get it turned in, it's done right. We'll be watching this one closely. Uh, also, uh, phase 3.2, I guess they're calling it, of stimulus funds potentially coming, Thomas. We'll, we'll follow that one closely as well. Uh, but just want to thank you all for your great insights tonight, uh, staying on top of these very important issues because they're all impacting us all in a very uh, local and personal level. So thank you for, uh, for your insights. And thank you for watching The Hinkley Report. Uh, this show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. We're so glad you're with us tonight. We'll see you next week.